Would you please welcome Dr. Mark Armitage. I don't need that. I'm using my laptop. Thank you, Dr. Baugh. David, is my microphone okay? Can you hear me in the back? If you cannot hear me, please raise your hand. Hey, that worked. Well, this morning I didn't get a chance to show this video. Uh, it is more appropriate for what we're talking about today. What you are watching is a very tiny uh, fiber. It is a nerve fiber. And I'm stretching it with a pair of fine needle forceps. Now, these forceps are so tiny at the edge. This is under about 25x magnification. They're so tiny, you can put them right through your finger. They're that sharp. So you really have to be delicate with them. But what I did is I collected this fiber from a Permian bone. And as Dr. Baugh mentioned, these are uh, north of 200 million years, up to 300 million years old. Look at the stretchiness in that fiber. This is a nerve, folks. This is a nerve from Permian, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. So I didn't get to show that this morning, so I wanted to show it to you today and get it on film. Uh, so let me continue then with the presentation. So what we are doing today is talking about the tissues that we have recovered from the Permian. This has not yet been published, so you're the first ones to see this. Uh, we're very excited about this, and we intend to go dig for fresh bones, because these bones that we've been working on have been out of the ground for about two decades. So if we're finding nerves like that in specimens that are out of the ground for two decades, we want to go dig fresh ones. Well, I want to do a little bit of review first, because the last time I was here, we talked about a paper that we had just uh, accepted for publication. We spoke in August, right? And then it was published in September, also in Microscopy Today. And in that paper, we published our results of blood clots in dinosaur bones. How many of you have heard that there are blood clots in dinosaur bones? Okay, I'm glad you're here today, because you're going to see something new. That video is on our website, and it's on your website, so you can watch that and learn about that work. That was all triceratops. Uh, and so this is a, a, a picture of one of those bones. This is a triceratops. I think this is horn material. And uh, it has been thin sectioned. So we take a bone like this, we put it in a special machine, and it shaves it down to about one-third the thickness of a human hair. So it's, it's a very laborious process, but we get it thin enough so that we can examine it under the microscope. Now, you see the bone is kind of brown, yellowish brown here. And this ages uh, over time. Even 100 years in the ground would cause this kind of bone material to kind of darken a little bit, right? But this here is excessive. See all this black stuff? And it's all in the canals. These are blood vessel canals that go through the bone. So you have canals in the bone, and the blood vessels and the veins and the nerves actually travel together inside those canals. This is all clotted blood, folks. It's all clotted blood. And so what we showed was that the blood, which has iron in it, is still present in the canals. Uh, this is a bright field picture, so now we're pushing light through that thin section of bone. So this is all light coming from the microscope. You see how light it is. But this is all black. This is a blood clot. And look at how much of the total volume of the vessel canal is cut off. This is rare, actually, to see this much of an opening in some of these clots. Most of the clots that we find are fully filling that lumen, that opening of the canal. This is what it looks like under a regular bright field microscope. But then we used a special microscope that works with UV light. It's very dangerous for your eyes, so we have to really protect ourselves. But the, the advantage of the UV light is it makes the iron autofluoresce. What does that mean? Glow, glow right? All tissue glows if you hit it with a certain energy, a certain wavelength of light. All tissue glows, okay? And so we take advantage of that property. 
and we hit it with UV light, which makes the iron react, autofluoresce, give off its own light. And, and it does it at a characteristic wavelength. So we know we have iron, and it's right here in the canals. Now, I'm not going to take a long time to talk about it, but there is a theory that iron preserved the soft tissue. How many have heard of that, the iron preservation theory? A couple of you. Oh, this is then the work that we published in Microscopy Today in September. We found it in the, the horn, the rib, and the frill. And in fact, it was six individuals that were separated from each other in the digs who had clots, all triceratops. Well, we've done more work of that on that, and I'll show you that in a second. But I've discussed a little bit of the significance of why this is important. There's a medical condition that you may have heard of called disseminated intravascular coagulation. Who would repeat that to me? No takers, right? It's hard. <laughs> it's a med known medical condition in the medical literature that happens when a, when a human drowns. When there's a human drowning victim, when they die through drowning, their blood stays clotted in their soft tissue and in their bones. You get clotted blood when you die from asphyxiation in water. If you survive and you're revived in the ER, which happens a lot, you bleed out. Why? Well, there's this process of coagulation that you've heard about. It's a one-way reaction. It's dependent on the reactants. When clotting begins, it's a one-way reaction. It goes till all the reactants are gone. And if you die, you stay in that condition. If you survive, it starts to go backwards. And instead of clotting, you bleed out. So now these ER physicians and nurses are trying to save your life while you're bleeding out because they resuscitated you as a drowning victim. These guys weren't resuscitated. So their bones are full of clots. This is important because the clots sequester the iron from what are called Fenton reactions. Don't worry, I'm not going to do chemistry on you today. Picture Pac-Man running around eating those pellets. Fenton reactions needs water to create the Pac-Man that go and eat the tissue. And boy, does it eat the tissue. How many of you had a steel bumper in Detroit during the winter in the past? You know what I'm talking about. Iron eats the steel. Imagine what it does to soft tissue, and it is highly destructive. So we're showing that the iron is left in the canals. It didn't migrate out of the canal into the bone, right? You can see that, can't you? So the iron was unavailable, and if these vessel canals are clotted up and blocked, the water is not available. Water is required for Fenton reactions. So we think we have a great answer to this iron uh, experiment that I wish I had the time really to talk about the experiment because it is, it is really not the kind of experiment you'd want to conduct to prove that iron is the answer. Everybody's acting like iron is the answer, but they haven't proven it. In fact, the structures that I am going to show you today, that nerve that you just saw, iron doesn't affect it. So it's hard to explain this iron experiment based on the findings that we're making. So we think we're making headway scientifically, and we think that's important. Why do I mention all that? Because we decided to process some nanotyrannus bones that we collected in Jordan, in Jordan Montana. Uh, May of 2016, we collected a rib, and we collected a vertebra, rib and a vertebra, and we thin sectioned those like I just showed you, and you can already see some of the black in there, can't you? So we found clots in nanotyrannus. Again, this is a bright field picture, but I'm, I'm using both the UV and the bright field at the same time. So you see the light coming through the bone, and then you see the iron reacting. If you turn off the, the bottom light, it looks like this. And I kind of made it monochromatic so it's more easy to see. But all of this iron in here is returning a signal saying, I'm here and not here. See that? So nanotyrannus is behaving the same way as all those triceratops specimens did. Here's another shot of that. 
There it is, monochromatic. Look at all this beautiful iron just pooled in here. And it didn't cross the barrier into the bone. It didn't migrate into the bone. So what preserved the tissues <laughs> if it wasn't the iron? This is from uh, the rib. And so you see a beautiful bifurcation here in these canals. So blood vessels, blood veins, and nerves were traveling in here. Uh, and now you can see it reacting to the UV. You see a little point here at the end of this, and that shows up dramatically when you just do the epi illumination. So we're getting really good corroboration here from all of our specimens that they are responding uh, to this technique. So there's a lot more work to do. We want to analyze this. Someone was telling me, and I can't remember who it was, they said, I showed this work to a retired ER physician, and he started naming all the products in here. He, he had names for everything in there. So I really want to meet that guy. So now we have corroboration 200 miles away from each other of clots in seven different organisms that are separated. Sometimes my computer gets a little slow. The tissues of the Permian. Now we're talking at a time in Earth's history where we're told amphibians lived on this supercontinent that was pretty much all one piece 260 million years ago. And this, the, the United States is sort of right in here, and that had to migrate 8,000 miles to get where it is today. So these bones were buried here and transported through plate tectonics 8,000 miles away, yet they show no abrasions or scarring of any kind. So I wonder, hmm, how did that happen? But this is where they are found today in Lawton, Oklahoma, and in the Texas red beds here in this country. They're also found in Russia and England and other places. So uh, Carl mentioned this morning that the Cretaceous circumscribes the earth. Yes. So we feel that soft tissue is a cellophane wrapping around the entire earth as a reminder to us that the flood was global. Yes. And we intend to dig all over the world, if we're allowed to, yes. to show this. Now remember, too, the time frame. Not only was it an 8,000-mile trip, but it took place over 1,000-year periods. Would, would you like to live a thousand years? I wouldn't. But imagine living a thousand years. At the end of a thousand, would you say, let's do another thousand. Let's go to two thousand years. I don't know, you might be young and strong at that point, ready to continue. But mu multiply that thousand year period by 280,000. That's the number we're talking about in terms of age. It's incomprehensible when you think about it. We're talking about two organisms that we have studied so far. Eriops, he was about six feet long. Again, these are amphibious organisms that are found in these dig sites. The other one is Kcops. And you can see here some of the bones uh, that Kcops produces, and we have some of those today. I won't let you hold these, but you can look at them. And so what we did is we decalcified these bones. We put them in a weak acid. And when we do that, the bone mineral just kind of deconstructs. So it kind of falls apart in the Petri dish, and then all the tissue falls out. And we can collect that, put it on slides, and study it. So that's what we've been doing. I'm not going to talk a lot about bone because it's on my previous videos. and you can, That's your homework class, all right? Go to the website, watch these previous videos as I talk a lot about bone. But what I want to point out is what I mentioned to you earlier is that these bone canals have the vessels and the veins traveling in them. Now, we weren't the first to publish on vessels. Other researchers have done that. But we thought, wow, well, if there's vessels in there, there must be veins. We were the first ones to publish on veins, and we did that in the September paper. No one had imaged veins before. We even found the valves that are in the veins. Remember, your arteries take the blood from the heart. It's under a lot of pressure. Boom, 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 right, with your heartbeat. Comes back how? Through the veins. Not as much pressure there. So there's valves.
to hold the blood while it moves up back to the heart. Those valves have been falling out of these tissues, and we've been staining them with RNA stain, and they're reacting positively to RNA. We're the first ones to publish that. But we reasoned that, that there would be veins in here, and we also reasoned that there would be nerves. See this yellow line right here? They show it here a little more clearly. Nerves, veins, and vessels travel, travel in a triad. They're always together. And so we surmise, why not nerves? They should be there, right? If we're finding vessels, we're finding vein valves, shouldn't we find nerves? And that's what we've been finding. That's why we went to look for them, and we're finding them. Eriops is from 295 million years ago from the Texas Red Beds up in Archer County. That's north, right, I think? I'm from Seattle. Everything's north for me. <laughs> My jokes aren't working today, brother. It's the lunch, isn't it? Yeah. Do I need to make you stand up again? All right. What's the results of our decalcification on Eriops? Liberated osteocytes. Osteocytes are the little bone cells that live in bone. They make bone. They dissolve bone. Did you know that your skeleton is recycled every 12 to 15 years? Completely recycled by these little guys that live in there. Yeah, they're cute. They're fun. We're going to show you osteocytes from these cells. We're going to show you tendons, not only liberated, but uh, in the bone. We're going to show you fully clotted vessels, and we're going to show you clot canopies. What's a clot canopy? Well, you'll have to stay awake, and we'll show you. These are cells from Eriops, 295 million years old. The preservation gets better as we go back in time. There are more branching on these little thread feet. These are the little extensions that come off the osteocytes, and they touch each other. All these cells are touching each other. North, south, east, and west, every direction, all these cells are touching each other or talking to each other at the same time. It's almost like the neurons in your brain. This is in your bone. So here's Eriops osteocytes. Look at this field of cells in collagen and look at all the connection points between them. The preservation gets better the deeper we go in the fossil record. Anytime you're ready, computer. There it is. This is a liberated tendon. This is for tensile strength in the bone. And I'm going to show you pictures of bones that look like pin cushions with these things sticking out. But here one is liberated. It's under polarized light and show, it's showing strain inside. This is an extruded fiber. It's like a plastic rod. And you can see some of the particulate matter in here that's part of it. But it's showing you the stress. In polarized light, if you take a, a water bottle and cut off a piece of that and put it under a polarized light microscope, you'd see all kinds of colors in it. Why? It's under stress. It's extruded and frozen in that condition. That's the way these tendons are. They were created and frozen in that condition. So we're finding tendons liberated. Well, I told you I'd show you a pin cushion, didn't I? So you're looking at a piece of Eriops bone that we decalcified partially. These things I'm finding are decalcifying 10 times faster than Triceratops and Nanotyrannus. I have to literally pull them out and wash them to stop the decay because it happens so quickly. But I want you to note all these vessels, vessels still in the canals. That's a vessel. This is a tendon. This is a tendon. All of the other ones are vessels. And look at how dark it is inside. It's fully clotted. And the vessel wall is still there. So vessels are intact in this bone. There's one tendon just sticking straight up out of the bone. And notice, notice it's clear. So it has no pigment or anything. Here's another shot. You can see it from a little bit different angle. But what we're picking up now are these canopies. 
And here's, here's a vessel that obviously wound through a canal. We erased the canal, right? We took the bone out. And so there's the vessel, fully clotted. These canopies are up at the top of the vessel near the surface of the bone where capillaries would form. And so even the capillaries uh, clotted and we have those showing up as a canopy like a tree canopy. I don't know about you, but I'm astounded by this stuff. I, these are impossible pictures. That's what I call these. Impossible. They can't be there. Not supposed to be there. And they're there. Here's a beautiful picture of a clot. I'm going to show you a video of one in a second where we'll focus in and out. And you can see the canopy right up there at the top. But all these sticking up out of the bone, fully clotted. So that was Eriops. Let's talk about Kacops. I showed you that one. He's a lot shorter. He's only about five inches or less in length. This is 230 million years old from Richard Spur, Oklahoma. What did we find? Liberated cells. Now we're having liberated nerves. You saw tendons in Eriops. Here's nerves in Kacops. Anybody know what a lipid is? Raise your hand if you know what a lipid is. What is it? Louder. Fat. It's fat. It's like oil. It's like olive oil. Imagine pouring olive oil into the Cretaceous and walking away for 10 years, 20 years, 100 years, 1,000 years. This is 230. It has lipids in it. I'm going to show you movies of lipids and pictures of lipids, clotted vessels, and chondrocytes. These are like um, osteocytes, but they're in cartilage. So we have preserved cartilage with cells in them. Again, beautiful cells, wonderful preservation. You might even be able to make out internal organelles inside these cells. Look at the network. All the collagen now has gone away because these things sit on a collagen carpet that gets filled in with bone mineral. But look at all the connections in here. I've never seen this in Triceratops or Nanotyrannus or any of Dr. Schweitzer's work with T-Rex, the sum of it, but not like this. 230 million years old, Richard Spur, Oklahoma now. Oh, am I going backwards? I am so sleepy, guys. I haven't slept in three days, so. Okay. I don't mind being short, I tell you, I really don't. This is a liberated nerve from KCOPS. Now, you're going to have to watch this morning's lecture because one of the things we showed in our paper that was published, remember this is unpublished, was the crosshatch pattern in the nerve. The collagen uh, connective tissue that surrounds the nerve fascicles. These are the nerve fibers where the electricity travels. The connective tissue that surrounds this is weaved across all of it, all the way up and down the nerve in a 45 degree angle crosshatch pattern. And you can begin to see a little bit of it in here. And up in here, you can see that crosshatch pattern. But this is exactly like the nerves that we found in Triceratops. I have a colleague who works on some of my specimens sometimes. And he sent me this picture, and he called it unknown fiber. I said, no, it's not an unknown fiber. Look at the crosshatch. That's a nerve from KCOPS. Beautiful picture. I promised to show you lipids. I have worked a lot with lipids. I thin sectioned probably 12 bombardier beetles and made maybe 300 slides. And they're full of lipids. The bombardier beetle, as you know, has to produce a reaction instantaneously. It needs a lot of energy. So it has large lipid bodies in its abdomen. So I know what they look like. I've stained them before. They react to osmium. And here are two lipids being squeezed out of the nerve that have been stained in osmium. Now I can do this because I use a really long objective that touches the slide. And as I focus, it puts pressure. And I'm going to show you some video of me doing that. And you're going to watch the nerve squirreling all around. But I can actually squeeze the lipids out by putting pressure on the nerve. And they just pop out. 
We saw this in our class this week. I was showing the students lipids from these nerves. Here is a thin section now across a clot in a, in a vessel. So here's the canal. The clot didn't go into the bone. All of these pits here, these are pits where the osteocytes lived. So this morning when I said that contamination can't be true because you'd have to have an osteocyte crawl through the dirt, find the dinosaur bone, crawl in, and set up in the exact pattern. How does an osteocyte know, I need to turn left or right? Come on. Contamination is not an issue. We know that we're looking at these tissues because we're seeing the diagnostic structures that define them. Here's the, uh, I just froze my brain, uh, cartilage, thank you. Here's the cartilage, and you can see actually cells dividing in some of this. You can see crenated outlines of cells. So some, ca some um, cartilage has been published, but not a whole lot, and definitely none this whole. Now, this is not the best picture of a mitotic plate. Dr. Schweitzer in her group actually published late 2019 a beautiful picture of actual chromosomes lined up along that mitotic plate. It wasn't mitosis, it was apoptosis that puts the, uh, uh, the chromosomes in that configuration, but nevertheless she imaged chromosomes Yeah, in, in uh, cartilage. So we're not the first ones to do that. So we have corroboration of nerves, clots, and cells between this whole time period. So we are hoping to dig at the Permian sites in about a month. Uh, we need your encouragement uh, and we need your support because the, all the structures you've seen have come out of these bones that have been out of the ground for decades. I can't imagine what we're going to find when we dig uh, fresh material. So I have some nerve videos I want to show you. And then we will go to Q&A. So, see if we can find these here. Okay, this is a, a movie taken through a very high-powered microscope where we focused through the bone. And you can see now some of these clots in there. Okay, look at this one. See, as I focus down, I should just let it play. See that? So, that clot is completely, that vessel is completely clotted from the capillaries where the surface of the bone was all the way down into the bone. Okay. So there's one. Let's try another one here. This is the tendon that came out of a Permian bone. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to advance it to about here and then I'm going to grab it right here and I'm going to play this over and over again. So watch me pull it out. See it pop? Watch it pop. Watch it pop. See it pop? See the elasticity in that? That's a 300 million or 250 million year old bone. Here now that tendon is mounted onto a slide and cover slipped. Uh, in permount and so it's a permanent preparation and you're seeing it under a thousand X magnification on a polarized light microscope and as I focus down on a thousand X you can see this tendon bending it is pliable and flexible and you just saw me pull it out of a Permian bone all right so Dr. Baugh, I have a present for you. I have the very tendon that's on these videos, which you now have, and you have the actual specimen for oh your, your collection. Oh, my. Oh, oh my. Did, did you label it so I won't get it mixed up? Yeah. yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Now we'll conclude. First of all, Remind me again exactly what I have. You have the tendon that you saw me pull out of that Permian bone, which looks like this. And we'll make a tremendous display of this. Mm -hmm. Credit to you. Well, and uh, well, yes, we give honor to whom honor is due. 
wow, I'm going to take care of this. Yes, please do. <laughs> now, now we're getting ready to conclude. He wants you to come by and actually touch these bones.